Hello and welcome to the i3 podcast. My name is Wouter Klein and I'm the Director of Content for the Investment Innovation Institute. For more information about our educational forums for institutional investors, please visit our website at www.i3-invest.com. There you can also subscribe to our complimentary newsletter, i3 Insights, in which we discuss investment strategy and asset allocation questions with asset owners around the world. Now, as you all know, we love our disclaimers in this industry, so here's ours. This recording is for educational purposes only. It does not constitute financial advice. Please enjoy the show. This podcast was sponsored by T. Rowe Price. As such, the sponsor may make suggestions for topics, but the final control remains with the Investment Innovation Institute. Welcome to the i3 podcast. I'm here today with Jessica Sclafani, who is a global retirement strategist with T. Rowe Price. And today we'll be discussing the five-dimensional approach to retirement. So Jessica, welcome to the podcast. Thank you so much, Bauter. Excited to be here. Can you tell me a little bit about your your background? How does one become a global retirement strategist? Sure. Well, I would love to tell you that as a young girl, I dreamed of becoming a global (laughs) retirement strategist, but I'm afraid that would be fiction. But it's a great question. And I guess as I think about it, um, maybe I didn't dream of this job, but it really has turned out to be my dream job. I started my career in asset management working with pensions, so I like to say that I've always been a retirement person. This early exposure to institutional pensions spurred my interest in research related to how we can structure investment solutions and more broadly retirement plans that meet the needs of retirement savers. I really love how investing for retirement specifically requires us to understand the technical aspect of building investment portfolios, but also the behavioral aspect of retirement savers too. And I know you already mentioned our five-dimensional framework, um, which we'll talk about some more today, but this research is a great example of that intersection between the technical and the behavioral. Yeah. Five dimensions. I thought there were only three dimensions. Can you tell us a little bit about why you created the five dimensional framework? Sure. So I think if I reflect on how we think about investing for retirement today, it's fair to say that we've gotten pretty good, though there's always room for improvement at designing structures and investments that best position individuals to save for retirement but we haven't spent nearly as much time on how we can similarly best position and support individuals to spend down those savings throughout retirement. So we really felt like the system, the global system, right, could benefit from research that fully appreciated and accounted for the trade-offs inherent in individual retirement income needs and solutions And then really a common framework, a common language for evaluating these retirement income solutions. So you said you thought there were three. Turns out when we began this research several years ago and then worked through it, we arrived at a list of five. And so can you tell me a little bit about how you arrived at these five dimensions? So maybe first I need to give credit where credit is due. The five-dimensional framework is really the brainchild of Berg Shui, senior quantitative investment analyst, PhD, and theoretical economist from our multi-asset research group. And when we think about how we came up with those five dimensions, we started with a very simple assumption that every aspect of an individual's in-retirement experience is captured by at least one existing retirement income product. From there, we comprehensively reviewed the existing universe of retirement income solutions, and we analyzed the trade-offs inherent across these various retirement income product designs. 
And based on this work, that's where we were able to identify five attributes that importantly are specific, mutually exclusive, and exhaustive. In other words, we think that these five attributes can fully characterize an individual's in retirement experience. Yeah, so we've been talking about the five dimensions for a while, but we haven't actually named them. Can you take me through what these five dimensions are? Sure. We were building up a lot of suspense. That, that exactly. was the impression I was getting. Um, so five attributes, uh, the first of which we call longevity risk hedge. So if I were to restate this as a question, it's what is my planning horizon? Alternatively, you could think about it as how long will my savings last? Our second attribute is level of payments. Here we ask, what will my savings generate in terms of annual income? You could also think about this as the yield on your investments. I like to think about this attribute level of payments as the much loved, very familiar paycheck, right? What is, the, what is my paycheck going to look like in retirement? Our third attribute is volatility of payments. So now we're not really thinking about the absolute amount or the value of the payments or the paycheck. Now we're really concerned with how much that amount could change over time. So again, another way to think about volatility of payments is to ask, what is the stability of my income? Our fourth attribute is liquidity, liquidity of balance. Here, we want to understand how much of my savings will I have access to if I need to use those savings. And then fifth, finally, this is the one that sometimes scares people. It sounds the most complex. Uh, we have unexpected balance depletion. So simply restated as a question, what we're really trying to get at here is how high is the risk of my money running out before I planned it would? So this fifth and final attribute, it's really all about an individual's risk tolerance. I think if I can just add one more thought here. So we have our five attributes, but what's really important to understand about our framework is that to improve or gain performance on any one of these five attributes, you have to sacrifice or compromise on at least one of the other four. So we're probably going to use the word trade-off um, a million times today, yeah. but that's really crucial to understanding our framework. Fair enough. So when I was uh, reading the, the research, um, one of the things it mentions for the reason to come up with the five dimensions as well is that the risk return measures that are used in accumulations are simply not good enough for uh, retirees. It doesn't meet the, all of their objectives. Can you tell me a little bit why that is? Sure. So first, let's start with the savings phase, accumulation. Here, we encourage everyone to save as much as they can afford and hopefully invest in a professionally managed, diversified portfolio. However, in the spending phase, people really do have different needs and preferences. The diversity of people's priorities and preferences really was illustrated for us in some recent research that we conducted at the beginning of this year. This research focused on how individuals between the ages of 40 and 85 are preparing for and then living in retirement, all from a financial perspective. To reflect the fact that people have much more varied and diverse needs, we feel like we need to move on from that traditional two-dimensional approach that you alluded to, right, where we're primarily optimizing against risk and return and embrace a more dynamic and, frankly, complex environment that we believe is reflected through our five-dimensional framework. So maybe if I can just offer an example um, to make this a little bit more tangible. Sure. When we assess traditional investments, like those that are commonly used in accumulation, we assume that any income generated will be reinvested into the same asset allocation, and then we can calculate multi-year investment performance. But from this perspective, income becomes completely invisible. So I promised you an example, here it is. Let's consider we have two different strategies with identical 
allocations both distribute two incomes. In other words, they're going to make two distributions. One is a $1,000 distribution and the other a $2,000 distribution. The only difference between the two strategies is that they'll make these two distributions at different times. So I'd love to say I had a, a fun example uh, to describe these hypothetical strategies, but I'm going to go with strategy A and strategy B to keep it simple here. So we have strategy A. It distributes $1,000 in a bull market and $2,000 in a bear market. Then we have strategy B, which distributes $2,000 in a bull market and $1,000 in a bear market. Using traditional risk return measures, these two strategies will look identical. But you and I know that in reality, strategy B would have higher remaining balances for retirees than strategy A because it timed those distributions better. So what I hope was a simple example here, it helps illustrate the way in which traditional risk return trade-offs, which I always want to be clear, it has served us so well in accumulation, but it does fall short in terms of assessing retirement income solutions where income is really a key objective. I think that's a very interesting example because uh, a number of years ago here in Australia, we had uh, an opportunity where people could put in a million dollars tax-free into their super. And unfortunately, then the GFC happened and a lot of that money sort of became very quickly a lot less worth. So it's definitely something to keep an eye out on. Um, if we go to the five dimensions, um, I just wanted to ask, there was one thing that that sort of stood out for me where it mentions the dimension of longevity risk and then also a separate dimension as an unexpected balance depletion. Are they two different things? So I'm so glad you asked this question, Valter, because it's one that we get from nearly everyone uh, when we first introduce the five-dimensional framework. There's generally a lot of head nodding and then, wait a minute, can you just, how are those two different again? So I'm glad you gave us the opportunity to address that. We really think about longevity risk and unexpected balance depletion as two sides of the same coin. And that coin is the fear of outliving one's savings. Our most recent research explored individuals' concerns as they prepared for retirement and then also during retirement. The 2,500 individual investors that participated in this research identified not running out of money before I die is their number two top rank concern, which closely followed maintaining my quality of life, which was their top ranked concern. So we decomposed this big fear of outliving one's savings into the two more granular dimensions, longevity risk and unexpected balance depletion. So they are related because they kind of branch up into that fear that we see articulated in our research, but we've taken, again, a more granular approach into thinking about how we can address these risks, right? Or how we could mitigate each of these risks. So if we start with longevity risk, this is really driven by an individual's withdrawal schedule. If an aggressive withdrawal schedule leads to a shortened time horizon, which in turn means you have high longevity risk, adding more risk into the portfolio could help, right? Whereas unexpected balance depletion, on the other hand, this is driven by the risk level of the portfolio. If there's too much risk in the portfolio, then you'll have high balance depletion risk. And here, to address that concern, you'd actually want to lower the portfolio's risk level. This is the opposite of how we would think about mitigating longevity risk. So we see separating the fear of outliving one's savings into the known, which is one's planning horizon, or what we would call longevity risk in our 5D framework, and then the unknown, which is unexpected balance depletion. This is a real differentiator for our framework versus others in the marketplace that maybe take a higher level approach. And this probably also gets us back to your question of 
you know, not three attributes, five attributes. Uh, we're really trying to be uh, specific when we look at these things. Yeah, yeah, very granular. So one of the the risks I often see in in retirement strategies is it's, it's quite a hard balance to find out when to de risk people. So most retirement strategies de risk people as they come close to retirement, but this is also where they have the highest balance and where the investment returns are the highest. And I think that there is sort of a a point where contributions are almost, you know, negligent versus the investment returns getting close to to retirement. So how do you address the problem of when to switch into a, a less risky strategy? Well, I'll start off by saying the trade-off. And I promised you we would say trade-off a lot of times today. So here we go. The trade-off that you're describing in your question is... Um, one between risk and return. And it's a defining characteristic of the accumulation phase of retirement investing. But I think what we have to remember when investing for retirement, people don't purely chase return. This is an important nuance. Um, And this concept is particularly true as individuals get closer to retirement age. The ideal outcome is that future assets are enough to cover future liabilities in a way that will support an individual's desired in retirement experience. This relationship between future assets and future liabilities provides us as investors with relatively good guidance as to what an individual's risk level should be, particularly as they're approaching retirement age. I also think one thing that comes to mind with your question, it brings me back to our research. So remember, we just talked about the number one ranked concern for those individuals that we surveyed among the ages 40 to 85, as they thought about their priorities in terms of preparing for and then living in retirement, their number one concern was maintain my quality of life. To me, this translates to save enough and invest in a manner that will allow my savings to support a lifestyle that I'm accustomed to. So not looking to hit it out of the park with return, um, but more of that consistent experience. And in that survey, um, looking at um, how people rated the five dimensions, and you mentioned whatever we're most uh, fearful of. But I also found that there was an interesting result that uh, volatility was rated as, as sort of the least at, at 9%. Do you think that that is potentially a financial literacy issue uh, where people maybe not understand the concept of vol- volatility enough versus, you know, the simple concept of running out of money? I think it's a, a really thoughtful question. And we did um, get maybe not the same exact question that you just posed, Walter, but People wanted us to explain the methodology for our research to understand if those that responded in the survey really understood what we were getting at. And of course, financial literacy is part and parcel of that. Um, But I'm going to say that, no, we don't think uh, financial literacy impacted our results. And I'm going to walk you through two reasons. You can let me know if you you, uh, believe me or not. (laughs) Uh, reason number one, and again, this gets to the methodology for our research, right? Reason number one is the questions that we use to obtain individuals' preferences were very straightforward and all rooted in actual examples. So I want to be really clear that in our research, we never asked individuals how they think about volatility, or how they think about unexpected balance depletion. Oh my goodness, no. Yeah. Rather, what we did was we offered respondents choices between various products, and we cycled them through so many different products that we could then understand how they assigned value across the different attributes of each product, volatility being one of those attributes. So we feel that our methodology was different from what you may see in other research pieces. Um, And we feel confident that those who participated in the research understood what we were asking them. Um, But it's a fair question and one that I get a lot. So I'm glad that you um, asked it. The other reason too, 
coming back to your question, why we weren't necessarily surprised to see volatility as um, having the least importance for our respondents that participated in our research, you have to remember that. So this was research that we conducted in the United States. And that means that respondents knew that they would have social security as their foundation for retirement income. So with social security as the ultimate backstop for income, we think that um, individuals can tolerate some degree of income fluctuations from their investments. The range of volatility that we explored in the survey appears to fall within or close to that tolerance band. So again, I think that's why it emerged as least important. It was volatility that people felt like they could withstand. Now, this is US-based research. I realize I'm talking to you. You're sitting in Australia. So I did I did have a think on, well, might this look different in Australia, right? I think that the relative importance of volatility of payments uh, could be higher in countries where a public pension provides less of a backstop or among high income cohorts of a population for which a government retirement benefit like social security in the US or the age pension in Australia, that would account for a smaller portion of their total retirement savings. And really when we kind of tried to test that assumption uh, that it would be of greater importance for high income cohorts, we did see that kind of pull through in our research. So when we looked at how high earners assigned relative importance across our five attributes, we observed that those high earners do care about volatility of payments slightly more than the lower income earners. Okay. Yeah, yeah, that's very interesting. So I, when I look at retirement strategies, uh, often the, the topic of guaranteed income streams or guaranteed products comes up. And there have been a couple of attempts here in Australia where uh, you, you basically take sort of an accum accumulation product and then add on uh, uh, building blocks to it, of which a guarantee is a big part of it. But at the same time, when I look into sort of the, the the benefits of these products and the income stream that are attached to it, it doesn't seem to really do much before the age of 86. After that, if you live on beyond that, then they start to pay off some interesting income streams. But it's it's sort of a long time before they start to kick in, which I think partly is related to, to uh, these products uh, not being very popular. What, what is your view on guaranteed products in a retirement strategy? Sure. So, well, let me let me first answer that from the perspective of our research. Okay. So we just talked about the that volatility of payments. That attribute was assigned the least value across our five attributes. The attribute that gathered uh, the highest relative importance in our research was longevity risk hedge, which is really part and parcel of what you're talking about. Mm. And, you know, we saw this come through in two ways. So uh, longevity risk hedge um, had the highest score in terms of importance. And then we also saw in the qualitative component of our research, again, I think we started to talk about this, that statement, not running out of money before I die, that was a top concern for people. But I think that what happens is, Valter is, and I see this a lot in our industry, we talk about guarantees, but we tend not to talk about what folks have to give up to achieve that guarantee. So we talk about it as a benefit, but we we tend to ignore the other side of the ledger, which are, well, what are the sacrifices you have to make to get that guarantee? The trade-offs. The trade-offs. Here we go. Yeah, you're picking up on that. I love it. So one of the most interesting findings from our research was that we found people were willing to give up an additional 6% of their annual income in retirement to go from knowing that their savings would last them until age 100 to having a guarantee for life. So 
this is when if we were all able to see each other, we would have a dramatic pause because I think that um, that that was really fascinating to us. Most of us won't live past age 100. So one could argue that if you already are planning on having your savings last you until age 100, one could say you're all set. You're good. Call it a day. But our research showed that many people assign significant value to that word guarantee, guaranteed for life. And I think, you know, there's no right or wrong answer here. It's all about, dare I say, individual preferences and trade-offs. Yeah. Um, and uh, again, I feel like we've come full circle in a certain way. You know, I started off by talking about how I love the technical aspect of, of what I do, but then the behavioral element really can't be ignored. To some people, that 6% is worth it, and to others, it's not. Yeah, it's very interesting that it comes up with uh, quite a specific number there, because that, I presume, um, will be a good starting point for some of these uh, guaranteed products to, to uh, a look at as a base for for developing new products off as well. Um Finally, I wanted to talk a little bit about, you know, uh, the difference between accumulation and, and retirement. If I sort of put it in the local context, we we had a number of years regulations coming into place that said, OK, well, we mandate people to put money in their superannuation. Maybe we should put some rules around what a default product should look like. And then once that was put in place called My Super, it sort of makes sense. But then they started looking at the retirement space. And I think um, there was sort of relatively quickly the realization is you can't do that in retirement. The circumstances are just so different. It's it's not as easy as just giving everybody a 60-40 portfolio. But sort of the holy grail in this is to still find a solution that sort of mass customizes a, a product for retirees so that you can't give everybody financial advice individually have to find so, some sort of thing that, that works for the majority of people. Do you think that with sort of all the developments that we've recently seen in artificial intelligence, that that could help in creating this sort of mass customized product? So Voucher, I, I tell you, you know, it's an intriguing concept and it's not totally out of the realm of possibility. But if you today asked various AI chatbots to provide you or me with retirement income advice that is truly applicable to our unique circumstances, you'll see that they fall short. So there's today, we're not there yet. But again, not totally out of the realm of possibility. I also think, and again, I hope I'm not a broken record on this point, but not everything we do related to retirement income is rational or informed by economics, right? Yeah. Um, so people like to talk about really important things like retirement to another person, to a human being, not a computer, not an AI chatbot. Um, so there's there's value to that too. And I think uh, there's still, as you mentioned, there's some problems with AI uh, hallucinating from time to time. You don't want to have that in your retirement strategy. Well, Jessica, thank you very much for your time. It was great talking to you. Thanks so much. Good talking to you too. Thank you for listening to the i3 podcast. For more information, please visit www.i3-invest.com. Thank you very much.